I am excited to share with you guys today. We are in a series, as you know, called Summer Reading, where we're talking through uh, some of the different books that our pastors are reading through. And I just want to say from the outset, had an interesting kind of dialogue this week. Just because we're going through a book does not mean an endorsement of everything that, past, uh, that author says or does. Um, we, these are just books that we're going through. We know the ultimate authority is, is the Bible, is the Word of God. But these are some books we're going through that we're just gleaning principles from. So uh, I'm excited to get to talk through one today that, uh, that I just recently went through. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I just want to open us up in prayer. And God, thank you so much for this time. And God, thank you for every single person here today. God, thank you that you know everything about us. You know uh, why we're here. You know our struggles, our, our shortcomings. And God, I thank you that the heart of the gospel is that you love us, that you died for us while we were still sinners. So Jesus, today, thank you that you know how all, every challenge we face, no matter what it looks like, I thank you that you are greater, that you are stronger, uh, and that it's not about our ability to figure stuff out. So Lord, today, I, I, I know that it's not messages and songs that change hearts, but your word, uh, your power, your love. So I pray that today, you know what every single person in this room needs. It's not about uh, the message I've prepared. I pray that you would speak through me. <laughs> And, uh, and, that you, and that your will be done in this time, God. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the book that uh, I'm going to be talking through is a book called Own the Moment by Pastor Carl Lentz. Carl uh, oversees Hillsong Church in New York City. And really his book is uh, a collection of stories. What he's talking about is that we, we know that our lives are a collection of moments. In fact, uh, the average American man has 40,318,776 40, moments. The average American woman actually gets 42,825,888 minutes. So I, I just think, guys, we get more done efficiently. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's definitely not true. But we, we, we have these moments, right? And if we're not in the habit of capitalizing on the moments that we're given day to day, then we're going to miss the lives, obviously, that God gave us. So that's the essence of his book. And he's talking about you know, waking up each day with a sense of urgency, with a sense of, hey, I want to you know, live the life that God gave me to the fullest. The challenge, as many of us are aware, is that the divine moments that God gives us don't come generally with neon signs attached to them. They don't come as these obvious teed up opportunities. They generally come disguised as mundane daily life. And perhaps even more pointedly, they come disguised as problems, as situations, as inconveniences. As Pastor Mark Batterson says, everybody wants a miracle, nobody wants to be in a place to receive one. Because when you're in a place to receive a miracle, you're desperate, you know? So, uh, and, and that's kind of the idea here. So what we're gonna have to do, therefore, if we're gonna own the moment, if we're gonna capitalize on the opportunity God gives us, we're gonna have to get used to seeing uh, potential where others see problems. We're gonna have to get used to seeing breakthrough where others see breakdown. We're gonna have to start being able to see the possibility of resurrection where others see death. And that's obviously a very different countercultural way to see things. In fact, I, uh, I was looking it up. Some of the greatest inventions in the world actually started out as problems in disguise. Uh, <laughs> potato chips, for example. Not that potato chips are one of the greatest inventions of the world. I want to clarify <laughs> what I mean by that. But they're, they're, you know, they're okay sometimes. Um, they were created by a guy named George Crumb. And one day a customer sent back his uh, plate of potato chips or excuse me, his plate of potatoes many times and kept asking them for them to be more fried and thinner. Crumb lost his temper, sliced the potatoes insanely thin and fried them until they were hard as a rock. To the chef's surprise, the customer loved them and wanted more. So it's a kind of a silly example, but it's just one instance of, you know, the, of uh, there being potential where, and not that he knew what he was creating in the moment, but there, this idea that, that a lot of times potential and opportunity is on the other side of a problem, an inconvenience. I know for me, uh, when I think about this, 
I think about the first time that I spoke really publicly. The first time, I, I'd actually just given my life to Christ and I was at the College of Charleston and they asked me to give my testimony. They wanted me to share this story of how I came to faith in Christ. And I hope it comes as a surprise to you, but I was not, I didn't think of myself as much of a public speaker. And I remember that day, I was walking at St. Philip Street in downtown Charleston. I was walking down down the road. And I remember I just looked up and I prayed, God, I just, I was 18 years old. God, I pray that you would use me tonight however you want to. So I was nervous, obviously. So I had typed up my, uh, I had typed up my exactly what I was going to say on a computer and I was just going to print it out and read it. So I went back to my apartment. It was getting closer to the event and I printed out what I was going to say, or I went to go print out what I was going to say, but the printer wouldn't work. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I, I, you know, I try to get the printer to work, but I, it's getting close to the time of the event. And I'm like, gosh, I can't, I, I gotta go, I, I gotta be there. So I go and I still remember y'all sitting and is anyone here terrified of public speaking? Can anyone relate to this? Okay, all right. I'm just the crazy one that chose to do it for a living, but, um, <laughs> but I'm sitting on the floor and, uh, and I feel like I'm just watching an hourglass just run out because I know I'm about to get up and share and I have no idea what I'm gonna say. I just am like, okay, this is about to happen. So I went up there and guys, to this day, I'm like, I don't know if I was speaking Chinese. I have no idea what in the world I was saying, but I know people, uh, there, some people were crying. It was received you know, incredibly well. It impacted lives. And what's crazy is I went back to my apartment that night and I tried the printer again and the pr printer worked perfectly. And it was just like one of these deals where I could have, I don't, you know, I don't know, I, who knows, like, I, I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but it kind of felt like one of those moments where there was this, there was this problem, and, but I had prayed earlier that God would use it. And the way I kind of walked away from that was, I think God was like, all right, Chris, I, I'm going to use you, but I don't want you trusting your notes. I want you trusting me, so I'm going to orchestrate this. I don't know if that's exactly what happened, but... I could have run away from that situation. And I think that probably many of us, if you, I want you to stop and think. Probably many of us, if you think about the opportunities that you've been able to capitalize on, your, on in your life, whether in your, in your marriage, in your job, in your finances, probably maybe for many, if, uh, if not most of us, some of the most significant things that have happened in our lives came through problems came through hiccups, came through situations, especially if I were to go through this room and I were to say, talk, talk to me about times that you've seen the hand of God in your life. Probably for many of us, we would reference uh, illnesses. We would reference some situations that we wouldn't have wanted to be in, but we saw God move. And what's so important for us, if we're gonna own the moments that God gives us, is that we don't run away from those situations, that we learn how to see through a different set of lenses. Because I, I would venture to say that the majority of the moments we're gonna, if we're gonna miss moments in our life, probably the reason is, is that we're gonna look at that person, that opportunity, that individual, that situation through a lens, we're, we're, and we're not gonna see the potential there. And the temptation in those, in those times is for us to run away, is to shy away from those moments. Because again, everybody wants a miracle. Nobody wants to be in a place to receive one. And one thing I love about the disciples as they follow Jesus is that they're very similar to us. You know, these guys were following Jesus and frequently problems would arise. But as you go through the gospels, this was the fertile ground for Jesus to show them that he didn't see the world the same way that these guys did. In fact, the story that we're gonna be looking at, and you should have blank note sheets uh, and uh, the scripture and the points will uh, come up on the screen. But the, the story we're gonna look at is in John chapter four. And just to set up, we're actually gonna be looking at verses 27 through 42. And just to give sort of the, the premise of this story, uh, Jesus is talking, uh, he's, going from, uh, he's going from Judea to Galilee and he decides to go through Samaria. Now, one thing to know, some strict Jews in this time would not actually go through Samaria to, to get to Galilee because the Samaritans were an unclean people. 
They were half Jewish. They were half Gentile. They worshiped differently. There was some major divide between Jews and Samaritans. So strict Jews would actually go out of their way, go a longer route from Judea to Galilee. But Jesus, not notably here as a rabbi, uh, a Jewish rabbi at that, decides to go through Samaria. So he, and, and then he get, he's tired. The disciples have gone to go get food and he sits down at a well. And a woman happens to be there. She comes to the well to get water. And Jesus begins a dialogue with her. And many of you know this, but so now Jesus is talking to a Samaritan, which was definitely not customary. And he's talking to a Samaritan woman in a patriarchal society. Not only is he talking to a Samaritan woman in a patriarchal society, but he's also talking to an extremely immoral Samaritan woman in a patriarchal society. So this is, it's, it's sometimes hard for us to see it this way, but this is very culturally, religiously taboo. So Jesus is kind of already kind of messing with uh, how people looked at stuff. And that's kind of where we're going to pick up the story. Jesus, just so you know, prior to the verses we're about to read, he's just basically shown her, they've had this dialogue about how he's the living water. Um, he, he, he's he's kind of helped her see that he's the Messiah. And so she's getting real excited and is about to go and tell some of her friends in the nearby town, hey, I think I found the Christ. So that's where we're picking up in the story. So starting in verse 27, and again, it should, be, yep, we got it. Okay, so it says, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and, met and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Now there's a lot that we can glean from this story. But one of the things that is it is interesting to me is that Jesus is in Samaria here. And, you know, there's a lot that we could, that, that I could touch on. The fact that he's uh, interacting with and has this plan to save the Samaritans to save the Samaritans. I mean, there's, given the cultural and racial tension that exists in our world today, there's kind of a lot of layers we could unpack here. But what I really want to what key in on here is that he's in Samaria and he, he makes this statement. He tells the disciples, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Some scholars think that he was specifically referencing the Samaritans that were coming to know Christ. And what's so interesting about that is that here's Jesus saying, saying about a people group, saying about an area that was deemed unclean, that was deemed a problem to be avoided. He's saying, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields, they're ripe for harvest. So is it possible? And the disciples obviously don't ha really have an idea at this point. They're thinking about food. They're thinking about sandwiches. They, they don't really have an idea as to the work that Jesus is doing. So he's saying, hey, I've got the, I've, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I've got this other thing going on here. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. And I wonder if the same thing can't happen to us. I wonder if it's possible. So Samaria was a place to be avoided. These people were unclean. These people were stigmatized. There was a cultural and religious narrative as to why the Samaritans weren't going to be recipients of the promise of God. And I wonder if it's possible that we do the same thing, that there are areas in our own lives, our own, I wanted to kind of coin a term here, our personal Samaria. A personal Samaria 
is a place in your life that you have said is a problem to be avoided, and God is saying it's an opportunity to lean into. I want to define that again. A, play, a, a personal Samaria is a place in your life that you have said is a problem to be avoided, and God is saying it's an opportunity to lean into. So is it possible that there are that, you know, and I don't know what that would be for you, but I want you to start thinking about that. Is it possible that in your marriage, that there's a relationship in your family, that there's a job, that there's maybe a part of your own story that for you, you've called it unclean? You've said it's a place to be avoided. And what if God is saying to you through this, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields, they're ripe for harvest. It's actually in that Samaria that you've been avoiding, that you wanna pretend doesn't exist, that you wanna walk around, that I actually wanna bring about your next breakthrough. It's not, I'm not gonna deliver you from Samaria, I'm gonna deliver you through Samaria. You're gonna go to the place that is difficult. You're gonna step into the relationship that's hard. You're gonna embrace the job that is difficult. You're gonna, do, you're gonna step into it even though you've been avoiding it and that's actually where I wanna do the next great work in your life. So, we're, so I want you to have this idea of personal Samaria in mind. Because again, if we're gonna own the moments that God gives us, chances are it's not gonna be on easy street. It's not going to be as we kind of like stay in our comfort zone and as we, it's going to be through problems. It's going to be through situations that we wouldn't have put ourselves into. It's going to be in places like Samaria, places that we maybe have a narrative about that Jesus is trying to flip or turn around. So the first thing that we, that we're, that that we've got to do if we're going to own the moments that God brings us if we're gonna kind of embrace these opportunities, again, looking at this situation that we just read about, is we need to know that God is already at work in our situation. We need to know that God is already at work in our situation. I think that, you know, the disciples, they kind of, they had gone to the town to buy food, they come back and they're concerned that Jesus hasn't eaten anything. So Jesus is at work in this situation and they don't even know what he's up to. You know, as you read forward in the New Testament, we realize that Jesus has, is actually beginning to initiate a plan where he lets the Jewish people know that, hey, my plan of salvation extends far beyond the borders of Jerusalem. It extends far beyond that into people groups that you thought could never come to know the one true God. So for me, I know, you know, when I moved to Charleston, that was a time in my life that I was not really aware of God working at all. Honestly, uh, I, my initial plan, so I applied to a bunch of different schools and I applied to James uh, Madison University, uh, uh, College of Charleston, I think Coastal Carolina and Elon. So I actually, when I went to the James Madison campus, that was actually the one I fell in love with. And because my grade point average wasn't exactly my focus in high school, I got a, a very kind letter of rejection from JMU. And then after having visited the College of Charleston campus and seeing the guy to girl ratio, I <laughs> was convinced that CFC was the place. I didn't come to Charleston with altruistic motives. I came to party and play golf year round. It was kind of the, that was the, that was the master plan. And you know, it, it's, God didn't come to me and say, Chris, you will come to know Jesus Christ and you're gonna, you will find your wife and you will have children and you'll, you know, become a pastor and I'm gonna use you to reach many lives. Like there was nothing like that. It was a time in my life where I was just kind of lost, just kind of doing whatever. And I think that for many of us, it's really easy for us to feel like our lives can be so random. You know, we can look around and it's, we've had the same problems. We've had the same issues. We've had kind of the same dilemmas, the same people. And it's so easy to just take for granted that "Ah, this is just the job I have. Uh, these are just the struggles I have. This is just the story I have. These are just the things I'm good at. This is just the life I'm living. And for us not to step back and at least ask the question, is it possible? And again, going off the story, is it possible that the author of life is writing a narrative and providentially arranging and allowing circumstances in our life to lead in a direction that we just cannot currently wrap our minds around? It's kind of the curse of the familiar where we can start to feel like it's just random. And maybe some of the things that you've called random and disconnected, your aspects of your story and personality and all that, maybe it's not as random as we might think. In Acts 17, verses 26 through 27, it says, from one man, 
referring to Jesus, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. I love that passage, and I love Romans 8, 28, that says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I love that because it's all things. It's not most things. It's not just the good things. It's all things that somehow, you know, we quote every week in that scripture, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine that deal. One of the things I think that is, that falls into the bucket of immeasurably more is how God takes even the broken, even the parts of our lives that we wish, those areas of personal Samaria, those challenging areas that we would rather avoid, that God somehow has a way of taking those very things that we think disqualify us from the plan of God, the very things that we think inhibit the, God's best work in our lives, that God has somehow a way of weaving those things together to create a masterpiece, even though we can't see it right now. So we need to know, number one, that God is already at work in our situation. Uh, Number, number two, we need to allow God to challenge our assumptions. We need to allow God to challenge our assumptions. Again, the disciples had a narrative about Samaria. You almost can't blame them, the, blame the Jewish people in general for having the, the perspective they had. I mean, for a long time, they had been repeating theology in their minds that the Jewish people were the people of promise, and, and that's it. That's, uh, you know, we're God's chosen people, and all these other people are unclean. But now Jesus is on the scene and he begins to change the narrative. He begins to say, no, that this area that you've called cursed, I'm calling blessed. This area that you've called, uh, uh, that you have, that have called an area to be avoided, I want you to actually move into it. I've got a story that I want to write through these people that you think worship God the wrong way, that you've fought with, that you think have all the wrong heritage. I want to change your, your narrative about Samaria. And I know for me, uh, you know, I've had, I, I've had to do this some in my personal life. You know, without going into too much detail, I, you know, I grew up and uh, some of you guys know, lost my mom at an early age and experienced some early rejection in life that quite honestly created some baggage that I, that I brought into adulthood. And, I, and it's, it's, these are some of the parts of my story that quite honestly, I wish I could just delete. I think back on the time, one of the reasons I'm so thankful for our custom ministry is because I so wish I had that when I was in middle and high school. That's a time in my life that I look back on and I'm like, oh my goodness, what what, what was I doing? Why did I waste that time? You know, I just didn't have a clue. And through some of the you know, through some of the consequences of that, through some of the baggage that I incurred there, there's been a process of healing that I've really had to engage in. And, you know, I I think I've kind of, my attitude has been, you know, let me, let me just forget about Connecticut. Let me just forget about all this stuff I went through. I'm in Charleston. I'm a Christian now. I just want to forget all that stuff ever happened. But what God has been kind of leading me in a process of is, Chris, like these things that happen to you, these wounds that you incur, this baggage that you got is actually an area that I want you to move into. I want you to change the narrative. I want to challenge your assumptions about what happened because the things that you went through, other people have gone through. So instead of just deleting your past or, you know, just making it seem like it never happened, I want to lead you in a progressive process of healing through those very things not only to bring harvest in your life, but to bring it in the lives of others and for me to actually change my assumptions about that area. So I don't know what, what, it, is, what, what it is for you, but it might be, you know, that kid, you know, for some of you that have grown children. It might be, you know, you, it, it's become a personal Samaria. It's, it's become this thing that's like, you've got a narrative about it, that God, there's no way God could reach so-and-so. There's no way that I could ever get healing in this area. And quite honestly, when we walk around Samaria enough and we see the problems enough, we kind of get this confirmation bias. There's no way that God's going to do anything there. There are hopeless people. There are, this is a hopeless area of my life. I've prayed, I've tried, I've believed before. I'm done. It reminds me of the song we sing sometimes, walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you've never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, but you have never failed me yet. 
You know, that we have to allow God to challenge our assumptions with our personal Samaria. So, at, and then not only do we have to allow God to challenge our assumptions, but point three, we need to actually head towards Samaria. We need to actually head towards Samaria. So at this point, I really want you to think, what is the personal Samaria for you? What is it? It may be something, honestly, that causes the greatest amount of fear in your life. And one thing I want to be clear about, just because something in your life is hard does not mean it's a personal Samaria. And I want to be clear about that. There may be some, you know, a situation in your life right now or something going on that God actually wants you to get out of. So please don't hear me saying that everything hard in your life is a personal Samaria. But I also think that there, there at least, I would say for all of us, there's probably at least one thing, if not more than one thing, that would fall into this category of a personal Samaria. What is that for you? What is that thing that you're like, man, I don't want to get out of my comfort zone here? What is that part of your story that you're saying there's no way that God could move here? What is that relationship that you've written off, that family member, that, that thing that you're like, man, that marriage where you've said, there's no way we're gonna get any breakthrough here. There's a, you've got a narrative about it. And we have to actually head towards Samaria. The disciples in the story actually had to go, they were already in Samaria, but they had to go spend time with these people. You know, I don't know what that was like for these, for these Jewish uh, guys to go and spend time with these people, but it probably really messed with their heads. Like they've been heard their whole life that these are an unclean people group. We stay away from them. And now all of a sudden they're going into this uncomfortable territory with Jesus and watching him love on minister and bring salvation to this people group that they called cursed. You know, um, it, to, because going back to Jesus' statement, I tell you, open your eyes. Look, look at Samaria, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. That's one of the, so where we see the greatest problem, Jesus actually sees the greatest opportunity. Now, I don't know anything about harvesting. Do we have any farmers in here? Any farmers? Anyone know a farmer? Anyone heard of farmers? <laughs> I don't know anything about farmers, but my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that harvesting is actually pretty hard work. Is it not? Yeah? Harvesting is hard work. Like you probably got to get up early and I don't know. I grew up in Connecticut. I have no idea about farming, but <laughs> I don't even have any idea about gardening. <laughs> um, but but far, harvesting is hard work. I think sometimes when we envision places of abundance in our lives, when we picture breakthrough and harvest, at least for me, there have been times I've pictured Easy Street. I've pictured that's like, you know, the wind at my back and everything is working well in my life. But the harvest is actually hard work. I'm sure you could talk to a farmer or look that up on the internet or something and, and see that harvest is actually, that, that you're sweating during harvest time, that you're getting your hands dirty, that it is hard work. And I think that that's one of the things we learn in this story, like going into Samaria and, and being a part of reaping this harvest of souls that Jesus wanted to bring about was actually hard work. The disciples had to partner with Jesus to go into a place of discomfort and be in relationship with people that they would have normally not even wanted to cross paths with. So this is how we're gonna actually own the moments in our lives. It's as we, it's not as we kind of sit back and just have it, and just have our quiet times as we pray. It's actually recognizing that God is at work in our situations it's allowing God to challenge our assumptions about hard areas and us actually choosing to go into those difficult places. Like that is a huge, significant part of following Jesus. In ministry, in relationships, in our personal lives, it's actually choosing to go with him into places that we wouldn't normally wanna go to. But a beautiful thing begins to happen when we do that. And to help illustrate that, I wanna do like a big class participation thing here. So I'm not going to make anyone come up on stage or anything, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, what I would love for you to do is I would love for you to take out your cell phones. Tr just trust me on this. Just take out, take out your cell phones, and I want, uh, if we can, let's make the room go completely black. Okay. So obviously we know that living in the culture that we live in right now, that we live in a dark world. We know that. We see it on the news man, my heart broke when I saw the, mo the most recent school shooting. 
You know, we know that we live in a dark world right now. And honestly, a lot of us may feel like we're just fighting to survive. But man, when the darkness is the strongest, when the darkness is the most dense, the most thick, that is the greatest possibility for God to bring about change in our lives. That's the greatest possibility for God to use us. You know, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, can be like flashlights inside Walmart. You don't need a flashlight in Walmart. You need it out in the parking lot. You need a flashlight in the dark places. And to help illustrate that, if you've been at this church for over 10 years, I'd love for you, let's go rock concert style. Turn on your phone flashlight and hold it up. If you've been a part of this church for over 10 years, wow. So, okay, so we've got, so now the room, the light is definitely, the, the light's making a difference. These are, so this is as some of us decide to go into our personal Samaria. This is as some of us choose to go with Jesus into the dark places. You know, most of you now, a lot of people have a light that's near them and you could actually look to that light, but we still have not come anywhere close to saturating this room. Now, if you've been at this church for five to 10 years, go ahead and turn your light on. So now the light is harder to ignore because this is the thing. The body of Christ is only gonna work as all of us decide to allow God to challenge our assumptions. As we step with Jesus into the hard places of our lives, as we go into, as, as we're not repelled by the darkness, we're provoked by it. As we decide to go with God into difficult places and shine our light in hard situations, as we run towards people that aren't like us, as we create relationships with people who aren't similar to us, as we decide to, to, to to, to really love our neighbor as ourselves, as we decide to not just be Sunday Christians, but decide to be disciples in our workplaces, in our families, and take the teachings of Jesus seriously, we can really make a difference. Now, I would love for everybody who's been here, whether it is your first day to five years, to turn on your lights. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that should be everybody. <laughs> and now we've got a movement. Now we've got a movement. Now we've got a bunch of people that are going into every place that they're in and choosing to be light in the darkness, choosing to be light in their families, choosing to make a difference wherever they're at, choosing to not shy away from difficult relationships, choosing to love and forgive their enemies and forgive their neighbors and to be good news, walking good news to the people of Samaria and choosing also to go with God as he seeks to heal the, the personal Samarias. In my experience, that's been the hardest. As God says, you know what, Chris, I wanna use you to reach the world. I wanna use you to reach people, but you're gonna have to let me go to the places in your own life that you've called untouchable. You're gonna have to let me go to the places in your life that you're embarrassed by. You're gonna have to let me go into your life, into the places of shame and darkness that you don't wanna talk about because it's only as you allow me to love you in the places of your own personal Samaria. It's only as you begin to talk about that. It's only as you begin to let me heal you in the places that you wanna avoid, in the places that you've called unclean, in the places that you've said, I can't move. It's only as you allow me to bring change and love there that you're gonna have a heart and compassion to love others the way that I love them. It can't happen through you until it happens in you. And that's so important for us to realize. So I believe that God, what this message is about, is it's about God's love. I'm gonna pray for us. You guys can turn your lights off and I'm gonna invite the band to come up as we get ready for response time. Father, uh, we come before you. And Lord, I just, uh, I thank you that you love us in the places of our personal Samaria. God, there are places in each one of us, if we really want to get down to brass tacks, there are places in each one of us that we wish didn't exist, sins that we've done, things that we've struggled with. God, I'm just reminded of the very first thing that man said right after he fell from grace in the Garden of Eden. You said, where are you? And he said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God, many of us are hiding. God, we have these areas of our lives. We have relationships in our lives that we've deemed untouchable. We've said there's no way that you can move there. We've said there's no way you could possibly love us and bring restoration in Samaria. And God, I, I know that I'm guilty of it. So God, perhaps most importantly, I pray that you would help us to experience your love, your unchanging grace in the areas of our deepest shame. 
in the areas where we've had a narrative that we've tried to stay away from because it's unclean. It makes us uncomfortable. And because we haven't experienced your love in that area, God, we're not able to give your love in that area. We're not able to love others in the areas of their personal Samarias because we don't honestly believe that you love us in ours. So God, I pray that as we worship, Lord, that you would create a new conversation in us. As Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, I pray that we would know the height and width in depth of the love of Christ, that we would know the love that surpasses knowledge and be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God, I pray that you would guide us now as we respond to you. Amen. Well, guys, we're gonna respond together. And uh, we've got a, bat just so you guys know, we've got a baptism later today at four o'clock at Folly. And uh, maybe for some of you, the first step is you've made a commitment to Christ and your step is actually deciding to go out in the ocean and get baptized because you've committed or recommitted your life to Christ. And you're gonna decide today to say, you know what, I'm going public with it because I wanna declare before my church family that Jesus is my savior, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the faith, I live, uh, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm gonna choose today to go public and say, I wanna be a disciple of Christ 24 seven, 365. And uh, if, if you're not getting baptized today, we invite you to come and celebrate with those who are. You know, but I, I think really for each one of us, I, my hope, you know, we've got crosses to your left and right hand side. Maybe as an act of response, you're writing a personal Samaria on your heart and you're saying, maybe writing a prayer like, God, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to go to the places that aren't fun. I'm willing to go to the places of discomfort because I wanna experience the harvest. I don't want a life of comfort and ease if I'm sacrificing you and the plans you have for me. So God, I'll go to the dark places. I'll walk into the storm because you can still it. I'll walk into the hard places because you can bring harvest where there's only been death and destruction. We've got candle stations to your left and right hand side. Maybe you're going and you're lighting a candle for a relationship or a personal Samaria that you're gonna engage. As you take communion, I encourage you, you don't have to be a member of this church, just a member of the body of Christ. And as you take communion, just reflect on God's incredible love for you. Reflect on the fact that he sees all of it. He sees the shame, the hurt, the fear, the sin, the stuff that you don't wanna tell anybody about. And he sees the depths of your heart, as that song says, and loves you the same. And as you experience that love, I believe that that's gonna transform us, that we could love others as he loves us. Let's respond together.